Thank you very much, Dr. Bay. It was a very nice introduction. So I also like to thank the SID committee for inviting me to present here again this year. Today I'm going to talk about quantum dot display technologies. And in this talk today, I'm going to emphasize how these technologies can help drive improved color gamut. So in form of an outline, I'm going to spend very brief time telling you about who we are at Nanosys. Then I'm going to give you a technology primer. I'm going to, I understand that a lot of people in this room already know a lot about quantum dots, but I want to make sure everybody is on sort of similar technical ground so that as we progress in the talk, I don't lose people. Then I'm going to talk about factors that impact uh, high color gamut and displays and uh, some of the subtleties of, of colors and color gamuts. I'll then talk about the materials that are used in displays and also the markets that those materials serve. And then I'll talk about the technology roadmap, uh, three different technology areas. One, photo enhanced displays. These are the quantum dot displays that are on the market today. I'll talk about photo emissive displays, otherwise known as color conversion, something that's emerging, and electro emissive displays, quantum dot LEDs, the quantum dot analog and OLED. And then I'll wrap up with where I think all of these technologies in the quantum dot arena is going. So a little bit about us. We're a Silicon Valley company. We're actually just a few kilometers down the road from here. And we make a lot of different quantum dots, and some of them we make in fairly large scale. Uh, we've been around since about 2001, and so during that time, we created a lot of intellectual property in the area of quantum dots, a lot of patents. Uh, we make a lot of quantum dots. As I mentioned earlier, we have uh, over 50 tons annual capacity. And so uh, we can fulfill the needs from the, in the display market. And we have a tier one customer base. We have products in three of the top four global television uh, manufacturers. Our business model is pretty simple. We make materials. And the panel on the left shows uh, one of our reactors making red quantum dots. We also work with partners to get these quantum dots into uh, optical elements that are useful in the display industry. And so this shows one of our coding partners making quantum dot enhancement film. And we're also always trying to develop new technologies. And so, for instance, what I'll talk to you about later, quantum dot LEDs, uh, this is a, new, you know, a technology development area, hopefully, that will result in product sales in, in the future. So let's talk about quantum dot technology. We'll start with a little history. Um, I like to think about quantum dots in three different phases, a discovery, a development, and a commercialization phase. The discovery phase basically started in the 80s when quantum dots were discovered. Uh, Dr. Lou Bruce at uh, Bell Labs uh, discovered them, and uh, he had two postdocs working with him, well, two, two noteworthy ones for this discussion, Paul Visados and Munji Buendi. Uh, they started their careers at uh, UC Berkeley and MIT and did a lot of pioneering work in the 90s to help get this field started. In addition to their own work, of course, they graduated a lot of students and postdocs who went on, and the field is where it is today, largely because of, of those, those three investigators. Uh, development phase started around uh, 2001 or so. Um, basically, the methods that were used to make quantum dots got good enough that people could make materials consistently. And uh, there were some commercial activities at that time as well, mostly low volume applications. Some of the newer materials, like the cadmium free materials, were began development during this phase. And then finally, the commercialization phase, and starting in 2013 with the launch of the first quantum dot uh, display. What are quantum dots? They're basically just bits of semiconductor particles, and uh, they're pure semiconductors. Uh, they can be a variety of different semiconductor materials, so they can be made from silicon or compound semiconductors. And uh, they're small. They have the word quantum in their name, and most of you know that quantum effects are only observed on very small size scales. And so uh, quantum dots typically have hundreds to thousands of atoms in them. And they exhibit a property known as quantum confinement, which we'll talk about in a second. I said they're small, so they're, you know, they're bigger than very small molecules and smaller than macromolecules like DNA. And we'll, this is an important slide to get some of the terminology that we'll use in this talk. Um, physicists talk about semiconductors with regard, and they use term, terms like valence band and conduction band. Valence band where there are electrons, and conduction band where there are 
are empty orbitals and a, a energy gap between them called the band gap. Chemists, people working on OLEDs, for instance, talk about HOMO and LUMO. Molecules have highest occupied molecular orbitals and lowest unoccupied. Very analogous. Well, the quantum dot community uh, has pretty much adopted the uh, terminology of physicists. They refer to a valence band and conduction band. Although it's sort of a hybrid because they're not small molecules. The density of states isn't as high as you'd get in a bulk semiconductor, but they're larger than you'd find in a molecule. And an important thing about quantum dots is when they absorb a photon, just like a semiconductor of energy greater than the band gap, you can uh, promote an electron into the conduction band, and that's called an exciton. So it's important that we talk about light emission because that's why we want to use them in the display industry. And so you can see on this chart, I have the valence band and some several levels in the conduction band. And when a photon of light is absorbed by a quantum dot, an electron is promoted into the conduction band. And then at some point, that energy is re-emitted as fluorescent light. And that's what we want to harness in the displays that we build. There are a couple of figures of merit that are very important in this discussion that I want to point out. One is, what fraction of, of the absorbed light is re-emitted? Obviously, these are emitter materials. We want that to be very high. So that terminology is called fluorescence quantum yield or quantum efficiency. And you want that to be very high. Typically, it's over 90% in these types of emitter materials. The, the second thing you could ask is, from when a photon is absorbed, how long until all of that, that light is re-emitted? And uh, in, with quantum dots, that's on the order of tens of nanoseconds. So it's very fast. They can cycle very fast through these uh, energy states. The other thing that people, you know, I think are familiar with when it comes to quantum dots is this concept of tunability, of adjustable band gap. And so from a, a giant block of semiconductor material down to a very small semiconductor, a piece of semiconductor, the, the electronic and optical properties are unchanged. It's only in this quantum regime where we see changing properties with size. And so uh, there's, a, there's a threshold called the Bohr radius. And when you, when you get smaller than that, then, this, then quantum dots or semiconductors have size-dependent optical properties and electronic properties. And it, one way to think about this is if you're going to create an excited state in a semiconductor, there's some volume it typically would like to occupy. And if you force it to occupy a small a volume smaller than that because the particle is just that large, then there's a cost to be paid. And so this increases the energy of that excited state. And so you can imagine if you have a bulk band structure, uh, like is shown on the, the left in this, in, this in this diagram, imagine that material emits in the near infrared, so out of visible light range, for instance. And then you shrink it down past the Bohr radius all of a sudden you're increasing the energy, perhaps it now emits in the red. You shrink it down further, raise the energy further, it emits in the green. This is what leads to the tunability that's so valuable in quantum dots. So what I told you so far is relatively straightforward. The actual situation, like most of life, I suppose, is more complex than that. So first of all, they're not typically just semiconductor particles. They're typically core shell structures. This was a, a seminal discovery that happened <clears throat> excuse me, in the 90s where they found that by growing a shell around these core semiconductor particles, the optical properties would be drastically improved. And so if we look at the band structure in the middle here, we see that the core on the left has a smaller band gap than the shell on the right, the green uh, colored uh, band. And what this does is prevents the dangling bonds on the end, on the edge of the, remember quantum dots only have maybe, you know, hundreds or thousands of atoms, a significant fraction of them are on the surface. And if those all have unfulfilled bonds, these result in low energy states. And this is problematic for uh, good optical properties. So growing a shell around it is really important. And the shell should have a higher band gap. Otherwise, the, this exciton wouldn't be confined to the core. You want to keep that excited state in the core of the particle. Furthermore, there's things on the outside of the shell as well. Uh, so there are typically organic ligands there. This is required for growth of the particle, the way they're made in, in large quantity. And also, this confers processability. If you want to dissolve these in solvents, if you want to process them and use them in a production line, they have to be handleable in some way. 
You can't evaporate these like you would maybe an organic molecule, for instance. So a little bit more about history. Um, you know, there's been quite an evolution of quantum dot synthesis. In the 90s, these were basically the cadmium selenide was the first material system that was developed as, as quantum dots. And it was made by, and believe it or not, I was around in those days and making quantum dots, uh, by basically horrible procedures where you would take you know, toxic cadmium compounds, organometallic compounds that were air st unstable, and, and inject them into hot solvent to make quantum dots. Well, that, all of that technology had to be uh, worked out to make these in a practical, repeatable ways that could be scaled up. And so that was done in the 90s and early 2000s. And then in the kind of early 2000s, people started working with other material systems like indium phosphide and a number of others as well. And that came along fairly slowly until I would say around 2010 when the technology group at Samsung, SAIT, really began to improve the optical properties of indium phosphide. So why is this so important, what we're doing here? Um, if, if, if you wanted to make a precision semiconductor material by any other means, you would probably have to grow it on a wafer. And this is a very ineffective way of making large quantities of materials. And so, you know, one thing I point out here is if you could grow quantum dots, you know, edge to edge on a wafer, it would still take about 50 square meters of wafer to make a single gram of quantum dots. And they're very small particles, and so that's not an effective way to make them. So being able to make them in solution in commercial, you know, chemical process equipment brings the cost down by orders of magnitude compared to any other way you could manufacture such materials. So this is really an important aspect of this technology. In terms of evolution of QD applications, we're mostly going to talk about the display industry today. Earlier on, I mentioned that there were some smaller volume applications before the methods existed to make large quantities of materials. One example uh, is in biological labeling. The picture is of a, a, a cell that's stained with three different colors of quantum dots, each attached to different uh, proteins to target them to different locations in the cell. People also, because you could make so many different colors, uh, explored optical uh, color encoding and uh, used them in sensors and so forth. Uh, even as early as 2003, 2004, people saw the potential for quantum dots and displays, but it was still quite some years, you know, at least a decade before the synthesis methodologies and the ways to integrate them in displays really were worked out. All right, so that's it for the technology part. Let's, let's talk a little bit about what quantum dots bring to the table in this place. And a large part of that is, is color. So I want to go into a little bit of uh, background on color and color gamut. So here we see the familiar CIE diagram. All of this is uh, sort of a representation of all the light that the, uh, the eye can see. And around the two sides of the perimeter there, you see these are the monochromatic wavelengths of visible light. And within that are all the combinations of, of those uh, wavelengths. And uh, the, the points in between are what are called pointer's gamut. And pointer, I think in the 80s, went and surveyed you know, what colors are found in nature and basically came up with this, this, this list. So all the colors that I can see aren't commonly seen, but these are the ones that you would find uh, more commonly. So if you're building a display, clearly you'd like to be able to uh, show all of the colors in pointer's gamut. But the, the, the gamut that's typically used today that most display makers are specifying to is DCI-P3. It's not a formal standard. It's sort of a voluntary standard. It was developed by the motion picture industry. And uh, it covers about less than half of the, the colors that the eye can see and about, only about 85% of pointer's gamut. So you can see there, even within the DCI-P3 gamut, there are parts of the colors that are found in nature that aren't, uh, that aren't part of that gamut. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, it's not really a formal standard, but it's what people are doing today because it was only last year when the new UHD standard was adopted, and that's called BT2020. And that's shown on this slide, and you can see that the triangle, the gamut for, um, for um, BT2020 is much larger than DCI-P3. It covers about three-quarters of the colors that I can see and virtually everything in pointer's gamut. And, uh, and, you know, 
display makers are going to be are already starting to move to this as a standard, and over the next few years, this will be more fully adopted. It's clearly more challenging to 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 reach you know a full coverage of, of this color gamut than it is VCI-P3. I will say that uh, NHK in Japan is planning to broadcast the 2020 Olympics in BT 2020. So whether or not there are displays that will be able to show that is another question. But. So what would you like to do in terms of making a display with high color gamut? Well, ideally, if you're going to make a BT 2020 display, you'd like the, the sub-pixels shown here, and the sub-pixels of the display, to have the color primaries that define BT 2020, which I believe is 467 for blue, 532 for green, and 630 for red. And you want those to be monochromatic white, so narrow like a laser you know, type of bandwidth. Well, that's kind of tricky for most display manufacturers can't, don't have means to do that, so we'll, we'll talk further about that later in this. But uh, so this is, this is how, what we have to think about later in this talk in terms of achieving high levels of VP2020 coverage. But color isn't everything. You know, we're also respond to brightness in the real world. Eye's an amazing organ in that it, uh, it responds to so many uh, decades of, 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 the, of light intensity. Uh, but even within one sort of setting, um, it's still you know, responsive over many logs of dynamic range. And this is one of the reasons that in the VT20 standard, um, they set a brightness threshold for, the, for new displays to meet the standard of 10,000 nits. And those of you that are familiar with displays know that there are no displays today that create anything close to 10,000 nits. <clears throat> but if you want a display to be lifelike, this, is, this gets you closer. Oftentimes, instead of brightness, contrast ratio is talked about in display. And that's important. It's important to have very good black level in the display. So when a pixel is off, the display should be completely black. But to look at that as only a contrast rate, uh, ratio, I think, is, is not the right way to think about it. So the contrast would just be the brightest intensity that it can display, L max, versus L min, which would be the black level. So obviously, emissive displays like OLED or other uh, similar types of technologies have great black level, and that's really important. But in real world viewing situations, there is external light. You're not watching a, in a completely black room. And in that case, there is still reflected light off the display. And so the L min really needs to be corrected by L, you know, in the denominator with L reflected. And when you do that, you recognize that brightness is actually really important as long as you don't have a terrible black level. So brightness really drives uh, this sort of um, contra effective contrast ratio in displays. And here's an example. So on the left are two displays, a quantum dot display and an OLED display. And on the right is a signal analyzer, which is inputting BT2020 UHD uh, input into both of these displays. So same input, both displays. Now, as I mentioned earlier, BT2020 uh, standard is encoded up to 10,000 nits. Well, neither of these displays can make anything close to 10,000 nits. <clears throat> but if you look at the inset on both of these, you notice that they're different. You can see the sun in the quantum dot display, and you can't really make it out in, in the comparing, comparison OLED display. And this is because that 10,000 nit input data has to be mapped, and that's called tone mapping. So let's look at what a tone mapping function might look like on the next slide. So the, what, what you would want to do is, is, for whatever code value input, you want that to go all the way up to 10,000 nits. Well, displays can't do that. Even a Hollywood mastering monitor goes up to about 4,000 nits. But you can still see a big difference because of the higher brightness of the quantum dot display versus the OLED display in its ability to you know, show variation in these higher luminance, luminances. And so, you know, this, these tone mapping functions are important, and it also underscores the importance of driving to higher brightness in a display, as well as higher color gamut. Another thing that's important to color is, is spectral width. And I'm going to talk about two different materials here, um, you know, cadmium selenide-based quantum dots and indium phosphide, or also people refer to them as CAD-free quantum dots. <clears throat> 
And I mentioned that the BT2020 standard was to have monochromatic sources of light. Well, this is not monochromatic by any stretch of the imagination, but they're pretty narrow emission spectra compared to most other emitters. Both of them are, actually. And so you can see that the cadmium selenide system is still narrower than the, the um, corresponding indium phosphide uh, common dots. But I will say that's changed a lot over recent years. It used to, the indium phosphide it used to be much broader, and so the technology is really improving uh, for, for these. And they're both very good emitters. So what's needed? So we need narrow emitters. We need bright emitters. We need them to be tunable. If we want to make a display, the gamut that a display can cover match a, a particular gamut like BT2020, we have to adjust where that triangle resides. And so that means being able to adjust the wavelengths to optimize it. And so this is one of the huge advantages of quantum dots. It's not just a material and you don't have to go back to the drawing board. If 530 isn't the right wavelength, you can shift it to 534 or 527 or whatever. And of course, you need little or no out-of-channel color leakage or contamination. And this, this will raise its head several other times in this talk when we talk about some of the differing technologies. So sort of in summary, quantum dots have this. They have this high color purity, very narrow spectra. They have high brightness. They're tunable. I didn't mention, but of course, they have also high stability. These have been in products now since 2013, and they've been shown to be very stable. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a little more about these materials and about the market for them. Start with the market. Um, at Consumer Electronics Show this, this year in January in Las Vegas, 68 products, 68 display products showing quantum dots, which is almost twice as many as last year, 11 brands, and here's a list of, of some of those. In addition, quantum dot technology is really leading the high-end television market. Uh, it's currently outselling OLED TVs and predicted to do so for the seeable future, according to the, the guys at DSCC, who I think are talking at this conference. Um, there is also this issue of regulation. Uh, I've been talking about cadmium and CAD free. And the reason there is cadmium in displays is because back in 2012, a European organization made an exemption for it. So there's a European organization called ROHAS, or colloquially known as ROHAS, Restriction of Hazardous Substances. And they regulate the amount of toxic materials that can go into consumer products. And they decided in 2012 it was a better idea to put cadmium in displays and gain the efficiency because the energy consumed in powering less efficient displays outweighed the risk of the cadmium in the display. That was, uh, that was uh, extended in 2014. And that then uh, expired last year, so it's sort of just continuing at this point. And if we want to zoom into the present, we can see the date May 13th, 2019. That's today. That's the day that uh, comments closed on petitions to extend this. So probably what will happen is sometime later this year, that organization will decide whether or not to further extend this. So they could do about they could probably do three things. They could extend it as it is. They could extend it but lower the permissible limit, or they could completely eliminate the exemption. And if they do that, then it would eventually go back to the pre-exemption level, which is 100 parts per million of cadmium. And, uh, but there's a grace period, so even if they, say in November, decided to, uh, to, uh, to uh, it cancel this exemption, it would still last until... 2021, that products could be sold, mid, mid, middle of 2021. But anyway, it's, it's something that uh, needs to be considered as, as part of you know, a product strategy, for, for certainly for us and for companies putting these in displays. This organization is also very clear about how to interpret 100 ppm of cadmium. Um, you know, I've heard different organizations talk about it differently, but they say it must be less than 0.01%, that is 100 ppm, of the substance by weight at the raw homogeneous materials level. So if you make a film and you're laminating a bunch of things together, it doesn't mean you get to include all the, the films and so forth in that calculation. So it's a fairly rigorous requirement, and uh, so it's, uh, it's important to understand you know, what, what life would be like in the absence of this exemption that's in place. <coughs> 
Okay, so now I'm going to talk about technology roadmap for quantum dots. I'm going to talk about three different technologies. I'm going to talk about what we call photo-enhanced technology, which is all the products that contain quantum dots that are on the market today. And we, we tend to call that QDEF at Nanosys. I'll talk about photoemissive, which is where we move the color conversion from the backlight to the front of the set. And I'll talk about electroemissive, which is basically the quantum dot analog of, a, of an OLED. So let's start with the photo-enhanced. This started in basically in 2012, 2013. And the first concept was to build these things called quantum rails. Basically it was take quantum dots, dissolve them in a polymer, put them into a glass capillary, which are shown here, and uh, basically put those in the edge of a display next to the light guide plate with blue light emitting diodes behind them. The idea is the blue light would shine through these capillaries, uh, turn into white light from the red and green quantum dots, and then uh, go into the light guide plate and ultimately the display. A couple of problems with this. Uh, one is there was a pretty high defect rate in trying to make these capillaries. It's kind of tricky to make. It was also tricky to integrate these this structure into displays, so it wasn't that straightforward. And quite frankly, it's kind of incompatible with sort of the direction that the display industry has gone, which is to full backlit displays. So this never really caught on. Uh, what did catch on was quantum dot enhancement film. And basically, this is a film uh, which can be used in edge lit or back lit displays and uh, had a very long operating life, creates very high brightness, and uh, comes in you know, varieties that are cadmium or cadmium free today. It's basically a sandwich structure. Red and green quantum dots dissolve in a polymer resin, put between two sheets of barrier film, and, uh, and then uh, cured. And uh, the barrier film prevents ingress of moisture and oxygen, which tends to degrade the properties of the quantum dots over time. The whole thing, the, the quantum dot layer is maybe between 10 and 100 microns thick, and the whole thing is a few hundred microns in thickness. The way you incorporate that into a display is basically, instead of a, a typical display would have white LEDs in the backlight, you replace them with blue LEDs, and then in front of the, this backlight, you put the quantum dot enhancement film. What it does is allow some of the blue light to penetrate, to go through the film, but the, rain, the remainder is converted to red and green light, so what comes out the other side is, is white light. But not all white light is created equally. So here, if we look at this spectrum, and on the spectrum, I'll show a typical white LED. It's, it's basically a blue LED with a YAG phosphor that creates that broad hump. And so if you're trying to make you know, blue, red, and green light using these color filters, you see that the red light is kind of weak, and its, you know, and its majority is, is very much near the green edge of it, of the, of the, of the color filter. The green is very broad. And if you compare that, you know, and what you would do then is get rid of the YAG phosphor and just use a blue LED and add quantum dots, now you see that there's much better color purity in this implementation than there is with just a, just a YAG phosphor, for instance. So let's talk about how to achieve high color gamut. Let's, I'm going to go through sort of a, a few slides that involve some modeling. And... Uh, so I mentioned earlier, you want to achieve BT2020 color gamut. Ideally, you have three monochromatic sources of light at these wavelengths. And, uh, well, we don't have monochromatic sources of light, and luckily, quantum dots are tunable, so we could make those wavelengths. So let's, let's, let's create a model. And here's the model that I'll use. I'm going to say that the blue LED is 20 nanometers, which is pretty much what it is. Uh, Cadmium-based quantum dots, I'm going to assume that the the full width half max or breadth of that emission spectrum for the green is 22 and for red is 20. That's for the cadmium case. And for the cadmium free case, I'm going to say it's 39 and 42 for green and red respectively. This is a bit of an old model. Actually, the cadmium free quantum dots are, are better than that today. But I think for the purposes of this model, it's still useful. This is still a useful exercise. So that's what we'll use for this gamut model that we're going to talk about right now. So what happens if we make them at the BT2020 color primaries, those three wavelengths, what do we get? Well, we get pretty terrible gamut coverage. 
In other words, when I say gamut coverage, I should explain this. I'm saying if you take the BT2020 triangle, what fraction of that can we display with the colors that we're making? And so what we're doing with the cadmium-based quantum dots is 74% and cadmium-free is 67. But if you look at the triangle, you see the red's about in the right place, the green's in the right place. What happened to the blue? And you can see that this is an issue of LCD displays and the color filters that they use. So I've zoomed in here. I'm just looking at the blue filter. That's the it's labeled, the blue line. And you can see that the green emission, whether it's from the narrower cadmium-based quantum dot or the cadmium-free, is overlapping heavily with the blue color filter. So in the blue channel, we don't only have the blue LED light, we also have a lot of the green light. So this is a problem. So, you know, maybe that would work if they were truly monochromatic emitters, but they are not. And quite frankly, it's basically that the color filter is not in the right place. But quantum dots are tunable, we can make an adjustment. We can move those emissions further from each other. So if we do that, move them further apart, we can optimize this. And we have the cadmium-based quantum dots up to 88% BT2020 coverage and CAD free up to about 85%. So that's an improvement. You can still see that there's in the circle, there's still you know, some crosstalk from the green emission into the blue channel. So that's still what's limiting. Well, some of you have heard about wide color gamut filters. What happens if we use those? Well, let's look at it. Oftentimes, there are different, people refer to different things when they say wide color gamut filters, but oftentimes it's just a color filter at a higher concentration. So now you see the two very similar blue spectra for the color filter. <coughs> Excuse me. The wide color gamut one is the one that's there at a higher concentration, so it's the one underneath. And you can see that we have indeed de you know, decreased the amount of green light contamination in the blue channel. But by doing that, of course, we've decreased the blue emission as well, and we've decreased the brightness of the entire display. So this isn't a fabulous solution, but it, uh, it does improve the color gamut. And so when you do that, you get to 94% color gamut coverage for cadmium and 92 for cad-free. Now, there's a caveat here. Because of the broader emission from the indium phosphide, we had to move it further out to prevent it from contaminating with the green quantum dot. And to do that, we took a big hit in brightness. So the, the cadmium-free one that's 90, almost 92% gamut coverage also has 25% less brightness. So we paid a big price for getting that gamut. If you take a more modest approach to this and say, well, you know, I don't want to lose that much brightness, you can still get 88% with the cad-free, uh, you know, with 15% lower brightness than the cadmium case. So... so one of the things that, that many of you, if, if you're involved in displays, you're probably familiar with optics, you might say, well, what, can't we get a better filter? You know, what if, can't we use a, you know, a, a really high quality filter? Well, let's, let's do that thought experiment. Imagine you had a dichroic in just the right place. So there you have a, a, a filter that uh, ideally sits between the green and the blue channels. In this case, the cadmium-based quantum dots have 97% BT2020 coverage, and the CAD-free, 95% if you're willing to give up 25%, and still 90% if you're willing to give up 7% brightness compared to the cadmium case. So this is the single largest factor. You know, in all of these models, we never change the green filter, we never change the red filter. So there's nothing new about that. It's all we did was mess around with the wavelengths and the, the blue color filters. So that's this is an important area if we want to move the industry to higher gamut coverage. So, yeah, so the, I mean, the green filter does limit gamut somewhat. If we didn't get to 100% uh, gamut coverage, that's, there is some problem between the, with, the, with the green channel. The red is pretty much where it needs to be. Uh, obviously, making it narrower allows you to move it more into where the eye is sensitive, which is desirable for brightness. But the blue filter is the biggest con contributor to gamut erosion. In terms of reaching high color gamut, and with the idea that you know you may not be able to have higher levels of cadmium in displays, uh, nanosa scientists a few years ago created what we call Hyperion, which is basically a hybrid material between basically what the what scientists did was engineer a very low cadmium green emitter that had very narrow full of max and combined it with a cadmium free red emitter which is much broader 
but it turns out that green is more important that it's, it, to be narrow than red because it's the one that's between two color channels. And so what they were able to achieve is you know, very high, over 90% gamut coverage with this material and still remain under the 100 ppm uh, cadmium level. So, so far this is not, not terribly important because uh, cadmium is exempted and can be at higher levels, but if that exemption goes away, uh, this, will, this will become one way to still achieve higher, higher product gamut. So if we look at Nanosys products, we have cadmium-based, we have this hyperion that I just talked about, and we have cad-free materials, all three of these. If we look at a variety of color gamuts, we can cover basically 100% of every color gamut except for BT2020, and where you see 92, 91, and 88% for the, the three products, respectively. It's important to note that, um, you know, not only does full with half max impact brightness. As, you know, as I mentioned earlier, if you have a broader full with half max, you tend to need to move the red coordinate further where the eye is less sensitive and that impacts display brightness. Also, as the gamut get large, gets larger and you have to move these out further to cover more spectral space, you lose brightness as well. So it's hard for display manufacturers to go to high color gamut without sacrificing brightness, something that they don't like to do. In addition to quantum dot enhancement film, there's an analogous sort of uh, a display architecture we call QDOG, or it's quantum dot on glass. Basically, it's very similar to the QDEF. It's the same idea, other than there's not a standalone film. Instead, the quantum dots are deposited directly on a glass light guide plate and integrated into the display that way. It has a very thin layer, about 10 microns thick, and there's no additional, uh, uh, additional, you know, uh, conversion film needed. And so it has all the properties of quantum dot enhancement film, but it does allow for a narrower architecture, display architecture. And so, in fact, HP has a product now based on this technology. Uh, it's a monitor. Uh, it's, uh, it's only six and a half millimeters thick. It's, it's thinner than a smartphone. So there are some different ways that you can integrate quantum dots and displays that have uh, different advantages. Well, what has to happen in this market? I showed you earlier that uh, quantum dots uh, technology is really leading the high-end display market, but it's also important that we push that down into the mass market. It's important for us to, to gain volume, and that's, that's, that's happening. In fact, I can tell you that the selling price for, for quantum dots, or quantum dot enhancement film, has declined 30% year over year since 2013. And so how does that happen? Well, there were a lot of, you know, we weren't making it very efficiently back, back in 2013, but there are a, a number of things. One is barrier film cost reduction. We've learned how to make the quantum dots much more stable over time, and so we've decreased the requirements of this barrier, which used to have to be an ultra barrier to keep out oxygen and moisture from, you know, two orders, two or three orders of magnitude. And I can tell you this requirement is very close to going away completely, in which case barrier film will no longer be needed. Additionally, there are ways to integrate the quantum dots directly into the display without a separate film manufacturer step. For instance, quantum dot on glass, which I just talked about. Um, we've also improved the formulation over the years. We found ways to use less quantum dots per display by, by improving the formulation and, and improving the light recycling and output from, from that. And of course, just economies of scale. We're making much, much more now than we were making in 2013. So we've, you know, our supply chain is, 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 is been driven down in cost. And that's also been true for the barrier film manufacturers as, as the use has gone up, uh, prices have dropped as well. So one final thing I want to talk to you about with regard to this photo-enhanced technology is uh, the impact of fluorescence lifetime. Remember we talked about that very early on. And so in this, I want to talk about in a comparison of quantum dots in a competitive emitter material called phosphors. In fact, we talked about phosphors already when we talked about YAG, which is what's used to convert the blue light and the blue LEDs to white light. But these are different phosphors. Uh, and so what I have in these two graphs are each three traces and, and, uh, and the horizontal axis is time in milliseconds. And so each of the traces, have, each of these three traces is one of three things. 
One is a blue light, which is off when it's on the bottom and on. Show this. Off, on, off. So we're just turning a, a blue excitation light on and off, and we're seeing what happens with the emission from the red and the green display emitter. And you know, you can see on the left graph, they just simply overlay. You can't even see three traces. It's because whatever the blue light does, the quantum dot does instantaneously in this millisecond time scale. But that's not true for the KSF phosphor. You see the green phosphor does follow the blue excitation light perfectly, but there's a lag in the red. It takes a little time to get up to the maximum intensity, and then it takes some time to get back down when the blue excitation light is removed. And this is, this is important because you can see this. So in this image, there are two displays here, and I don't know how well it comes out on this. But in this case, like on a display, the, a white soccer ball is being kicked, and so it's rapidly moving across the screen. And so what you see is, in an advancing frame, the leading edge of that white soccer ball actually appears cyan, because it's red deficient. The red hasn't come up to, to maximum intensity yet. And then the trailing edge of the frame uh, shows is reddish, because the other colors have turned off, but the red still begins to emit. So. Now, this is a problem, and, uh, and it's also an issue in you know, fast scrolling and stuff. You can also see it. So that, that's sort of the technology introduction for the products that are on the market today. I want to spend a significant amount of time talking about where things are going from here. You know, what are the other display modalities that could use quantum dots? So next thing I'll talk about is called photoemissive. And this as I mentioned earlier, is moving the color conversion from a film in the backlight to the front of the display. This creates some new requirements. Now if it's in the front of the display, it has to be patterned at the level of the sub-pixel. <clears throat> so in principle, this display can be built with any blue light source. It could be a, 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 LC, a blue L, a LCD with a blue, blue uh, blue LEDs, it could be a blue OLED, it could be a blue micro LED. And uh, basically, it's blue light until it reaches the uh, sub-pixel, and uh, the sub-pixel then converts the blue to red or green, depending on which quantum dot material is residing there. It's useful to compare this to, to a, a white OLED architecture, which has an, a white OLED engine, in other words, RGB OLED in, the, in, in generating white light and then using color filters. Um, if we compare that to a design based on, say, a blue OLED, now we see that we only have blue LA OLED materials producing light and we're converting that light to red and green at, at each pixel. So if you compare these, you can see that, uh, you know, notwithstanding that blue OLEDs are less efficient than RGB, uh, still, you're converting the light rather than just filtering it out like you do in an ordinary LCD. So color filters on, a, on, a, on an ordinary LCD are subtractive. They remove all the components except what you want. And so if you can convert light to what you want, this is an inherently better situation. There are challenges with this. So the, 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 the thickness of the material that's at the front of the display has to be very thin. It's, black matrix and the, and the uh, color filter material that's at the front of the display is very thin, about 10 microns. And the requirement is different than in QDEF. In QDEF, you wanted some of the blue light to penetrate to make white light. In this case, you want to absorb 100% of the blue light and convert it all to the desired color. So in the spectrum, which comes from a display of this type, uh, you can see what you'd like to see is three peaks, red, green, and blue and nothing else. And in fact, that's what you see. But if you look carefully under the blue peak, you see there's a blip from the red and the green. And so what we're seeing is about a half a percent of red, of blue light in the red spectrum, and about 1% uh, of blue light in the green spectrum. So why does this happen? So this happens because not all of the light is, is, uh, is, uh, is absorbed by that layer. So I'm going to walk you through this slide a little slowly. So if we focus on the first two columns initially, we're looking at blue light leakage here. And what this is is the amount of blue light that's leaking through that thin layer of quantum dots. 
So if it's 1% blue light leakage, think of it as 99% blue light is absorbed. Okay, and you're absorbing almost all blue light, and presumably that's getting converted into the desired color. Well, if you have 1% blue light leakage, you can see that you have about 86% uh, BT2020 gamut coverage. If you have about a half percent, it goes up to 90. If you have 0.1%, meaning you're absorbing 99.9% .9 of the blue light, you have about 95%. <clears throat> so this is really important when considering gamut coverage. You need <coughs> <clears throat> you need high absorption. So, obviously we'd like to be somewhere up here. So what are the requirements generated by desiring these levels of gamut coverage? Well, you can see that in the required film optical density, it's between two and three units of absorption. And what's most interesting then, and we'll take this forward, is this requirement. Now this is a unit you've probably never seen before. Optical density at 450 divided by the mass. This is a property of the quantum dot. How much light it can be absorbed on a specific mass basis. And I don't expect you to, to remember this, but just note that the numbers are between 0.7 and 1 approximately. So that's what we would desire. If we look at cadmium-free quantum dots and we look at the absorption spectrum, a couple of things we'll notice. If you look at 450 on here, and I'm not sure I'm actually pointing that because I can't really see the screen from here, but, but you see that 450 is in a very unfortunate place, but unfortunately that's where the blue coordinate typically is in these 450 to 460, so it happens to be at a, at a sort of a local minimum in the absorption curve for green. And uh, you can see that green is a considerably poorer absorber of light at 450 than red. And if we go and look at the OD for mass for uh, typical green and typical red indium phosphide. So all of this is cat-free material. Um, we see that the, the numbers are 0.3 to 0.65. Remember, the numbers we were looking for are between 0.7 and 1. So this is sort of standard indium phosphide. These, these numbers can be improved incrementally. So the red is not a problem. Uh, you can get it into the range where you need it pretty easily. Uh, green is not going to be up there. So... So this is sort of a, a, a limitation of this material. So what, what can we do about that? We can do a couple things. One is you can do optical filtering. So one thing you can do is put what's called a yellow filter. It's called a yellow filter because it appears yellow, but it actually absorbs blue light. And if you put that over the entire display, the can take care of the, absor the emission from the remaining blue light emission from the red and green subpixels but the blue is so intense it still makes it through that. <clears throat> That's one way. This has a secondary benefit. Um, if you think about an ordinary LCD TV, what's at the front are color filters. Color filters are absorptive, they're not emitters. If you have now a, a display that has emitters at the front, well, room light can excite those emitters. And so if your TV is off, it might actually appear kind of reddish or something, you know, because room light can excite the, the quantum dots. So the yellow filter can actually help with that uh, spontaneous sort of room light excitation. You can also use typical color filters, you know, since you're not trying to remove all of, you know, white light, all of the other light than what you want, uh, since the amount of, 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 of blue light is relatively low, you could probably have a very thin color filter to, to accomplish this as well. Of course, the best solution, of course, is to have higher absorbing green quantum dots. And that's something that Nanosys is working very hard on. It's, uh, it's an important problem for us. <clears throat> so what's been done with this sort of color conversion technology? This is some work we did in-house some years ago, uh, basically trying to formulate photoresist from quantum dots. Because remember, we have to pattern these at the pitch of a display. And so we were able to make material that was basically similar to to any other photoresist. It could handle and be processed in the air, uh, went through high temperature bake steps, the chemical, the UV exposure and chemical development that photoresist typically have to endure, and able to make these. Now this is sort of an in-house demo, it's not, uh, we're not experts at it. But uh, in fact, we've collaborated with Sumitomo on this and these types of uh, quantum dot photoresists are, are available through Sumitomo Chemical today. With these types of materials, uh, at least the materials that we were making in-house, we could make features down to three microns, I suspect, with, 
with the material available today, it's, it's much less than that. So, um, you know, if you need to pattern down to very small feature sizes, this represents a, a good way to, to do that. If you're not going to use photoresist, another way to deposit these is through inkjet printing. Nanosys is working with uh, experts in the ink formulation industry to make uh, uh, ink materials using the quantum dots, <clears throat> both solvent-based and more commonly solvent-free UV curable inks are, uh, are being made. And uh, again, this is all based on cadmium-free technology. And these are printed directly into the black matrix of the display and uh, cured in place and uh, made to be compatible with common you know, manufacturing scale uh, inkjet print heads. Here's an example of uh, some features that were display pixels that were printed by a partner, D DIC, in Japan. Um, you can see that the red and green uh, quantum dot color conversion layers, if you look in the graph on the lower right, they have good angular distribution of light that you expect from this type of emissive material. Um, the blue was basically just resin and scattering media and was not optimized, so we don't, don't read too much into that. That's, that's, that's just not part of the demonstration. They further then made an RGB array, and uh, when you know, excited with blue light, it, of course, uh, creates uh, white at uh, uh, desired white point. Features on this are 80 microns width, so you can see that you can make fairly small features this way. You could make, you know, high definition, uh, 4K, K type uh, features, uh, you know, televisions this way. Um, obviously, if you need feature size smaller than what's possible with inkjet printing, then you need to consider another approach. And so, oh, yeah. And so I was, yeah, so. A lot of people at this conference are talking about micro LEDs, so I wanted to mention that. Obviously, they have huge potential as, as, as in displays. You know, power consumption, high brightness, or, you know, very fast response time. That, you know, ultimately uh, would be probably the best display out there. But of course, there are a lot of problems with getting these things to, to manufacturing scale. And they're complex, particularly an RGB micro LED array. So we're working with several partners to. Um, to basic, that are trying to make all blue micro LED arrays and then use this color conversion technology to convert certain uh, pixels to you know, uh, red or green. So, so which, which, which technology would you want to use, photoresist or ink? And uh, if you can use ink, it's probably better because there's much better materials utilization with ink. With photoresist, you put put it everywhere and you get rid of it where you don't want, so it's somewhat wasteful. However, if you have to make something beyond the capability of inkjet printing, which is, I think, around 50 microns, um, then, you know, you're probably constrained to using that. Um, good news is, a lot of display manufacturers have invested in uh, large-scale inkjet printing technique, uh, uh, instrument uh, manufacturing tools over the recent years, and so there's, that infrastructure exists. One last thing I wanted to mention in terms of uh, patterning has to do with transfer printing. And this, is, uh, this is work from a, a local Silicon Valley company called Transfer Devices Incorporated. They're able to use transfer printing to make different features with quantum dot ink. In fact, uh, the feature on the right shows quantum dot lines that are at uh, 60 nanometer pitch, so incredibly small pitch. So I think this is actually potentially very useful technology in certain situations where you need very high resolution features in a small display. So I'm thinking maybe like near eye displays or something like that. This, this could be important. Certainly an inexpensive way to, to deposit materials. Okay, so finally I want to talk about the third area for uh, uh, quantum dot displays and that's electroemissive or quantum dot LEDs. Here, it's basically simple in, in, in structure. Basically, you have a, a thin film stack, including quantum dot emitters between two electrodes. Very analogous to an OLED. Um, have, would have all of the desired properties of an OLED, and perfect black levels, and UA angle, and so forth. 
but also they improve color and improve brightness of quantum dots. So we talked about gamut coverage in the LC, in the LC, in the quantum dot enhancement film, the photoemissive case. We talked about it in turn. And the issue there was color filters. We talked about in the photoemissive case. The issue there was blue light leakage. It's very simple to describe with quantum dot LEDs. It's basically what what the, the spectrum of the emitter de determines the color gamut. When there's no other factors. So the current CAD-free quantum dot LEDs that we're making have a gamut coverage of about 80, yeah, BT2020 gamut coverage of about 88%. Uh, there are some non-idealities in the materials that we're making today, and so the photoluminescence spectrum, if you take those same materials we put in our LEDs and you look at the photoluminescence spectrum, you excite them with light instead of with charges, uh, they have better emission properties. And so in that case, which is something we think we can get them to in, you know, in the future by solving this problem, we can get that to 92%. And that's quite, quite an improvement from you know, the competitive technologies. I don't want to spend too much time on this um, because I think uh, the last speaker spent a lot of time talking about light extraction and some of the other issues. But I think that, that what I do want to say about this is if you want to consider quantum dot electroluminescent device efficiency, it's, it's basically just like an OLED. It's, it's you know, the same factors that drive internal quantum efficiency, so recombination efficiency, uh, uh, probability of radiative emission, photoluminescence quantum efficiency, the same factors are at play. Um, in terms of light extraction, the light's fairly similar. Maybe it's a little bit narrower for the quantum dots, so perhaps there might be some means to optimize around that. Not significantly different. In terms of recombination efficiency, um, this is something that in the imperfect devices that we have today is something that, uh, that we're wrestling with. But in principle, you know, as you'll see in shortly in this presentation, you know, people have accomplished a lot with quantum dot LEDs in terms of efficiency. And so it's pretty clear that this can be very high. Uh, in terms of probability of radiative emission, we all know about these quantum mechanical selection rules that, that limit the amount of emission that's allowed for a fluorescent emitter. Good news for quantum dots is they're triplet state emitter, emitters, so they're more like a phosphorescent OLED. Their, their uh, radiative pathways are all allowed. And the photoluminescent quantum efficiency, uh, I've, we've already talked about that in the context of the other display architectures. Those are, um, you know, very easy to get over 90% and, and, and higher than that as well. So there's no, you know, when you think about quantum dial there's no showstopper with regard to device efficiency. Take a look at the energy levels. Uh, this is for a cadmium-free quantum dot uh, electroluminescent device. This is all, all we work on at Nanosys. You see, one thing is that the energy levels are a little shallower, closer to vacuum than the analogous OLED. The other thing you can see is that it's a, not a very great structure. In, in fact, you can see that there are fairly large uh, hole and electron injection barriers and that uh, it looks like there's the potential for electrons to spill over from the emissive layer into the whole transport layer directly, uh, which would lead to, uh, idea, you know, obviously, inefficiencies in the device. So part of the reason for this is that, you know, people are using the same charge transport materials that people have used for other purposes like OLED. Nobody's yet building dedicated uh, uh, materials for uh, CAD-free quantum dots. And that actually needs to happen. Since last year, uh, there have been some very interesting publications that, I, that I'd like to highlight. <clears throat> First one's called Visible Quantum Dot Light Emitting Diodes with Simultaneous High Brightness and Efficiency. This is from a group of Chinese investigators who published a very good uh, light output from, uh, from, from all three colors. The green in particular had uh, output of over 600,000 nits. And if you compare that to you know, the brightest OLA that ever was uh, ever, ever made, it's you know, orders of magnitude greater. So I think not only is there this you know, expectation for higher color performance from these types of devices, but I think there should be an expectation that they also will be much brighter. Uh, another one is droop-free colloidal quantum dot light emitting diodes. This came from a group at Los Alamos. Um, typically, um, quantum dot devices have shown something called, people refer to as droop or roll-off, and in the 
efficiency versus luminance curve, which is here, the typical thing is that the maximum EQE is obtained at very low uh, luminance, and then as you increase luminance, it falls off fast. What this group showed is by the work that they did, is they could make quantum dots that had high EQE, and then even up to you know, over 100,000 nits, they're still, still maintaining that high efficiency. So I think this is also an important advancement. And the third one is highly stable QLEDs with improved hole injection by a quantum dot structure tailoring. This is from the group at TCL, and they showed what amounts to be, for the red material, literally commercial level of stability for, for that device. So I think this is a, a really big advancement too. I think all of these are. One of the things I want to say uh, about this is all of this work is done on cadmium selenide, so there's still a limited part of the community fairly small part of the community working on cadmium-free quantum dot LEDs. But, um, but I think this is really an important advancement. All three of these groups made these advancements by altering the structure of the quantum dot. And to not go into credible detail, I think this, the way that I would probably summarize it most generally is that they all took careful control of the, the radial profile of the elements uh, from the center of the quantum dot to the outside. And uh, if you think about something that's only, you know, some nanometer thick, that's, that's actually tricky to do. But it's, that's the level of control that you need to make these uh, types of high-performing materials. I want to talk about a little about milestones. Um, uh, in terms of EQE, which is one thing that people used to judge, you know, the maturity of, of these types of devices, you see that a lot of improvements have been made in, uh, in these uh, devices. And if you look at, you know, uh, assume that, you know, commercial level of performance is around 15%, there are a lot of examples of materials performing over that level. So, uh, and I will say that almost all our, our data are up there, but most of the data on this, on this uh, chart is cadmium selenide based. If you want it, if you're interested in heavy metal free quantum dot LEDs, um, I encourage you to go to Ray Ma's talk on uh, Friday, uh, Friday morning, and he'll talk about in detail about some of this work. So, EQE isn't the problem. is isn't gonna isn't what's keeping these things from being commercial. Lifetime is what's keeping these things from being commercial, and so. Um, you can see that there's been an, uh, an improvement over time, but, um, but you know, I have the, the recent TCL data off the top of the chart there, so that's actually, I think, literally a commercial level of performance, but that's just for red. Green and blue are still behind and need improvement. And so uh, I think a couple things uh, need to happen is that uh, more work has to, has to go on in terms of understanding mechanisms of, of instability. <laughs> And there just needs to be more focus in general on, um, on stability. And I applaud TCL for publishing their work. So, so a lot of people ask me, oh, Charlie, when, when do you think that quantum dot LED stuff is going to be commercial? And, uh, you know, there's no really good answer for that. I think we could say that intelligent people could disagree about the answer. And a lot of that depends on what information you're using to reach that answer. <laughs> what I put here is, uh, you know, kind of the history of OLED uh, LT50 stability, and, uh, you know, from when that work kind of ramped up to when the first MP product was released. And then I have the very few data points that exist for the, for the, uh, uh, for the quantum dot analog. And so, you know, I think there are a lot of factors that could go into this. So one factor would be, how much, how much of the learning in OLED is transferable to QLED? Well, a lot of the backplane development, a lot of the other parts of the system that were developed are done. So there are some things, but in terms of device operation, how much is transferable? Another question is, how much of the learning in the cadmium system is translatable to the CAD free? That's yet another question. Another question might be, is will cadmium containing Q uh, quantum dot LEDs ever become commercial? You know, so there are lots of things. So there are a lot of factors in here that we have to consider. And uh, will another one is will the learning in the red that got the red lifetime as high as it did be translatable to blue and green? 
So depending on how you answer those questions, you can come up with different answers. Here's, here's one crack I've taken at it, and I'm sure I'll get some, some questions relating to this. So I'm not promising this. This is my guess. So anyway. So, you know, when we're talking about stability, you need to think about degradation. <clears throat> and so let's talk about some of the issues and, that are common to these types of devices but also are unique to quantum dot devices. Uh, certainly, charge buildup at interfaces that ultimately degrades materials is, is, is a big factor. And uh, materials in quantum dots, as we went, if we go back to the technology section, remember there are a lot of parts of this. There are ligands, there are things on the outside of the quantum dot. Uh, if we remember to the day when, uh, you know, OLEDs were very close, a lot of work was going into understanding impurities and, their, and the fate of those impurities and devices and getting rid of them. And that whole effort is quite different for these types of materials and hasn't really, that effort hasn't begun yet. Another thing is lack of solution process for supporting layer materials. So, you know, all of the early, a lot of the early OLED work was, of course, evaporated molecules. And uh, we talked about that earlier today. 100% of the quantum dot devices that have been made are solution processed because that's the only way you can make them. So the good news is when we get there, it's going to be a nice and expensive manufacturing method. But uh, we need to understand how these materials are deposited. And we need supporting layers that, you know, if you're going to deposit a material using a solvent on top of an existing layer, you have to make sure it doesn't dissolve the layer below it. So this issue of solvent orthogonality is important. How, how these depositions get made is, is critical. There are issues with charge balance as a device operates. Obviously, the TCL guys figured out how to get around that on the, uh, on the red device that they published. What are some of the unique attributes? Um, I kind of started to talk about this. Uh, the OJ process, I'll, I'll show you that on the next slide, so we'll skip that for now. Uh, interfacial and morphological effects. They're not evaporated small molecules like Dr. So was saying in the last, uh, in the last lecture. These are much larger things. They're, they're, they're particles, and so the interfaces are not homogeneous. And so this is also an issue that has to be addressed. Uh, quantum dots can be influenced by the fields that are present in, in, the, in these devices, and so, so that's something that has to be taken into account. And, uh, you know, I mentioned this earlier, different, the profiles of contaminants are very different than they are in OLEDs. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the OJ effect, because this is something that people are working very hard to, to, to divine, design, uh, design quantum dots that minimize this. Earlier, we talked about uh, the panel on the left, the formation of an exciton, absorption of a photon that goes into an excited state. Uh, ideally, that just relaxes and gives off a, a photon of light. But what can happen is a second absorption can occur before that first relaxation and recombination excuse me, takes place. In that case, you form what's called a bi-exciton. And you would think, well, that's not so bad. Maybe the same thing can happen. But unfortunately, what happens when you have a bi-exciton, typically, the when one of those relaxes, it gives the energy to the other exciton. So instead of having instead of having one of these still present, it, it, this recombines and gives the energy to this one, and now it's got twice the energy. And why is that a problem? If we consider this green bar, the band gap energy for green, for instance, and we give, and this is the sort of valence band, that's the conduction band, if you give it twice the energy, it's within a half an electron volt of vacuum. And so this is a very highly energetic electron. The converse property, the converse thing can happen too. You can also have what's called a hot hole. But either way, you have a very energetic particle that has the potential to escape the dot. And if that happens, now, if this leaves, now you have just a positive charge where the electron once was. It's a charged particle, and it's not emissive. So this is, uh, this is something that you know, through the structural studies and structural engineering of the dots, people have been able to figure out ways to, to minimize. I mentioned earlier, all the quantum dots, electro electroluminescent devices made to date are printed. Here's examples of inkjet printed devices, of spin coated devices, transfer printed devices, and it really portends the, the low cost of this technology once it's once it's once the stability problems are actually addressed. Okay, so we talked about these three major types of uh, 
quantum dot devices. What's, what's next for these? Let's start incremental, maybe with a summary of what I talked about. Um, and the photo enhanced, what's got to happen? Lower cost, more stable quantum dots, that's being worked on. Better optical filters, as we showed, that's very important. Um, improved heavy metal free optical properties to improve the gamut. This, every year, these people figure out ways to make them narrower and narrower. So this, this industry is addressing these things. For the photo emissive, higher blue light absorption quantum dots, uh, particularly green. Um, we and others are working on that. Higher quantum yield quantum dots. You might ask why. You know, aren't the quantum yields very high already? Yeah, they're close to 95%. That's still giving up 5%. And also degradation modes oftentimes relate to the inefficient part, not the efficient part. And in the electroluminescent case, ideally, quantum dots with deeper energy levels, improved charge transport layers that are better matched to the materials that people are actually using. And, uh, and I, I think I mentioned several times, better understanding of device degradation, impurities, and so forth. So that's sort of the incremental. That's the sort of the obvious way to go. Um, what are other quantum dot materials that are people are working with today. Um, there's going to be a presentation today on, on perovskite materials. Uh, perovskite, lead perovskites in particular, are a class of materials that only appeared about 10 years ago and have made incredible changes to what people can do with, uh, with laboratory solar cells. Um, they've been, people have been worked to make, you know, the analogy of QDEF with that, uh, with, with them. And, and, even photo emissive demonstrations. And so, you know, there's, it's promising from a light conversion approach, but it's got lead in it. That's another one of those Rojas limited materials. And so, you know, people that want to move away from cadmium probably aren't going to want to move to lead. So this is, this is a limitation. I will say that when I look at the literature, there's an enormous number of people working on lead perovskites. If only about 10% of those could actually work on lead free versions. It would be fabulous. Very interesting materials are two-dimensional materials, cad selenide, cad sulfide, nanoplatelets. So if you think of quantum dots, those are typically thought of as what are called zero-dimensional materials. They're points. If you think of like nano wires, people call them one-dimensional materials. So two-dimensional materials are sort of plate-like. And they have kind of interesting properties. They'd be really useful for uh, quantum dot light conversion, for instance. Their confinement is based on how thick they are. So you can tune them in that way but they still have very large mass, and so they have a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, oscillator strength or absorption ability. So, um, so these are really interesting. Again, if somebody would, I mean, it's very hard to translate this work to CAD-free systems, but ultimately that needs to be found. And then a very interesting system um, from, if you, those of you that are familiar with solar, there's a material system called SIGS, copper, indium, gallium, sulfide, or selenide. And then there's an analogous system called which has silver instead of copper. The problem with the copper-based system is tunable, it's a good emitter, but it has a really broad absorption, far too broad to be useful for as an emitter. But uh, recent work from some Japanese groups show that um, uh, they've been able to take the silver analog and get a fair amount of band gap emission. It's not perfect yet, but uh, you know, there's still a lot of this broad emission too, and the quantum yields aren't that high, but it's an interesting direction for, uh, for further study. <clears throat> so what are the, what's the future of QD materials? Well, if you're a cook, then what's in your pantry is what you can use. If you're a, if you're a chemist, then this is what you can use. Sorry, I left out the actinides and lanthanides. But, but if you want to look at what are the options for, semi, for building new semiconductor materials, that's where most of the semiconductor elements come from. Not exclusively so, but mostly. And if we take out all the ones that are nasty, then you see that there really just aren't many options. So let's let's take this from a from a sort of a, a different approach, from a data approach. If we look at the world of semiconductors, I find 131 of them in Wikipedia. But if I look at heavy metal free semiconductors, there is only 86. If I consider direct band gap semiconductors, those which are likely to have good emissive properties, then I find only 38. If I restrict myself to visible light emitting materials, and I put a reasonable range for the, for the band gap for those materials in there, uh, you know, 
then I find only 22. And if I then consider that, remember, I need to have a lattice matched uh, shell material, so that's, that's got to be available. Um, it has to be possible to be made by solution synthesis. I can't make this by some esoteric approach that's extremely expensive. And I still want it to have the properties that I like and high absorption and efficiency. You see that this Venn diagram is not looking that promising for us. Still, you know, if I looked back in Wikipedia back in 1990, they wouldn't list 131 semiconductors. They'd probably have well under 70 or something like that. So people find have done a lot of discovery, and you know, 10 years ago, the perovskites didn't appear on this list either. So what, what are directions? I've sort of alluded to this. There are antimony and bismuth-based perovskite analogs, and uh, uh, the materials that so far today have been published don't have very good properties. But if they could come close to the properties of the perovskites and not have lead in them, these would be really advantageous. And, and I, I think this deserves more attention in the academic community. Um, Cadmium-free two-dimensional materials, uh, the interesting demonstration I talked about with the nanoplatelets, if they could be converted to a different material system. There are other interesting 2D material systems, notably the moly and, and tungsten sulfides and selenides have this sort of uh, behavior, crystal behavior. It's early stage, but I think, again, a good good place for an academic to work. And nitrides. Nitrides, those are what people use in blue LEDs today. And so there are, uh, there are only a, you know, a few reports of this type of synthesis of nitrides. It's very hard to, to make nitrides in solution. It's very hard to activate nitrogen under these types of you know, chemical synthesis conditions. But it would be extremely desirable if it were possible. And I think this would be useful for, for quantum dot electroluminescence probably not going to have the absorption required for color conversion anyway. So, yeah, it's a, it's a mixed bag. So, in summary, I think quantum dot technology is basically leading the high-end television market today. And it's pushing down in price. I mean, you can buy a quantum dot TV right now for under $500. So, uh, bringing the cost down is really necessary to drive value in this, in this technology area. These other architectures that we've been talking about, they offer a lot of promise. The photoemissive case will have definitely better viewing angle, uh, better color, probably better brightness. Um, quantum dot electroluminescence, I, it's made tremendous progress in the last year, but it's still got a ways to go. And uh, I think there needs to be more support from the community at large in terms of uh, you know, common layer materials and so forth in this area. And uh, with regard to new materials, you know, the perovskites, uh, as far as I know, they're not commercialized yet, and they've been around for 10 years, and they have really interesting properties. So I think it's really important to look at the importance of, you know, this incremental uh, improvement and recognize that these new materials will come along. They'll come from out of the blue, and they'll come from people banging away at, at, at developing them for a period of time. But it's still, it's on the order of years. It's not, it's not months. So... Anyway, with that, I'd like to close and be happy to take any questions. Yeah.